morning, church. Uh, some of you might be wondering when we're doing the ASP video, and I apologize. We had some technical difficulties this morning, so we are going to delay that presentation for you for a couple of weeks to make sure we can show it to you in its entirety. But this morning, we finish up our, our series we've been in now for a few weeks called Warning Lights. And throughout this series, we've been examining those warning lights that light up on the dashboard of our car that tell us that we have car trouble and, and how some of those lights can parallel to our own journey, our own lived faith experience in life. There's nothing worse than being miles away from home and having something go wrong with the car. And the same is true with our faith journey. We can get off track before we even know it. And just like routine maintenance helps us to take care of our cars, making sure they're safe for the road, there are signs and indicators and things that we can do to make sure that our faith is kept in check. This week we're focused on the powertrain control module, which I mentioned briefly last week. And from here on out, I'm gonna abbreviate it to just PCM. And the PCM commonly controls more than 100 factors in a car or in a truck. It's one of several onboard computers, but it's actually the brains of the operation behind all of the control systems that operate your engine. The primary inputs to the PCM come from multiple sensors spread throughout the car, and most of them are oriented towards engine management and performance. These sensors fail at a much higher rate than the computers themselves do, and I know this all too well. From the time I was a child, and I'm talking young child, I loved cars. I loved going to car shows with my grandparents and picking out different things I'd love to have, and a dream of mine was to someday own a car that I could take to shows and, and show off and participate in this, in this culture. And then after months of looking, after months of showing cars to Nicole on eBay and dealership websites, and after months of having a look at me and roll her eyes at yet another car, I came home one night and I showed her a picture of a 1993 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme convertible. It was white, it had white leather, it had a white top, and my uncle had a 1993, the same car, except it was a triple black. So I had nostalgia for the car. And she said, and I about fell over dead, that we could go look at it if I wanted to. So that Friday we got up and we took the trip to a dealership just outside of Detroit. The car was being stored off site, so they went to get it for us. And Nicole said that the excitement on my face quickly faded the moment the car pulled up. You see, the pictures were much better than the car looked in person. There were scratches in the paint, the top had a rip in it, the seals were dry rotted, and I'm standing there calculating all of the things that I'm going to have to do to get this car back in good shape, and I quickly doubled the sales price of the vehicle, and I hadn't even driven it yet. I took it out for a test drive, and my disappointment continued because the car drove like an Oldsmobile not the sporty, well-handling vehicle I was looking for. So we returned to the dealer, and I had him put it up on a lift so I could see underneath, and oil was everywhere. So defeated, we got in the car, and we headed for home. And I felt like we'd wasted an entire day. So after having some conversations with some car friends, we settled on the possibility of a Miata, and I found a, an 07 locally, and we decided we weren't going to drive an entire day to go somewhere and, and on this adventure again, only to come home empty-handed. So we had the car inspected, everything turned out okay, we purchased it in November of 2014. Last summer, as many of you know, I began going to shows, I was having a, a ball, until one evening I was on my way to Bethel, and the check engine light came on. I took the car to a shop to discover that the powertrain control module had gone bad. It was gonna be just shy of $2,000 to fix. There was a labor strike in California and a parts backup that meant it would be late summer before I could get the car running and fixed and back on the road. So here I was, nine months later, less than a thousand miles of road time in a dream that I had had since I was a kid. And yet again, we were forced with a difficult decision. We ultimately decided to go back down to two car payments and let Scarlett go. I kept looking, and Nicole kept rolling her eyes, until finally we had a serious conversation waiting in line for a ride and drive event at the Chicago Auto Show this February. 
And I was not only able to convince Nicole to try again, but when we discovered that we were too far upside down on the car that we had just purchased last June, she allowed us to trade in her vehicle so that my dream would once again be fulfilled. This time I feel like we got it right. We bought new, we bought extra protection, there's a lifetime powertrain mechanical protection. They say the third time is the charm and I hope that it's gonna be the case. Now I tell you all of this to tell you I've been through the ringer when it comes to automotive repair bills. I know all too well the frustration of warning lights coming on and throwing off your entire day. And the same could be said when we face trials in this life. When we struggle in our faith walk or life as we know it, it can throw everything off for us. And if we experience a season of repetitive negative experiences, it can lead us into deep anxiety, deep depression, and this feeling as though we're in this inescapable black hole. And when we get to that point, our own internal powertrain control module, our brain of our operation can become our worst enemy. As the negative thoughts begin to perpetuate themselves and, and to, to creep in and we face fear and uncertainty and we begin to doubt ourselves and we begin to doubt our actions. Sometimes when a powertrain control module is acting up in a car, the simplest fix is, is to do something known as a flash, where you plug it into a computer and you reset it. It'll turn the light off, and if the light stays off, you've got success, but if the light comes back on, you've got a problem. When we get stuck in a rut, we have the ability to reset our minds, our thought processes. We can stop ourselves from going to those places of hopelessness and despair but it's a conscientious decision if that's what we want to do. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn with me to Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 4. Now, Philippi is the location, the first location, of an established Christian community in Europe. And Paul is writing to them while he is awaiting sentencing in his imprisonment in Rome. And in the fourth chapter, he's largely providing, and it's his closing chapter, he's providing this exhortation to the church about what they should seek and strive to do. He asks the Philippians, he says, seek out the mind of God. Rejoice in God always. And then he shifts to offer some things that people can be thinking about in order that they may do this. We'll pick up at verse 8 and read through verse 9. Hear these words. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. The writer of Proverbs says in chapter 15, verse 28, that the mind of the righteous ponders how to answer but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil. If you've ever experienced being in a pit of despair, you can understand this. I mean, we don't get up in the morning and, and just say, you know what, I think I'm going to be wicked today. But when we live in darkness, when our world is this, this feeling like we're in this black hole, we do and we say things that we don't mean. We react instead of respond. We don't think about how we can answer. We are more concerned about just getting out of the hole. And we're not always the best person to be around. And we can get sucked in easy, too. The world continually invites us to participate in politicking and divisiveness and gossiping and finger pointing and self-pity. But Paul told us in Romans 12 too, to not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed through the renewing of our minds in order to discern the will of God. You see, when our brain is all messed up, when we are thinking negative thoughts about ourselves or our circumstances, or our life is messed up either because of circumstances that have been forced upon us or things that we have done to our own selves, we can transform the situation first through the transformation and renewing, the, the resetting, if you will, of our minds. It sounds too good to be true, but it is as simple as Paul lays out in this passage from Philippians. 
Because if our minds are consumed with falsehoods and manipulation and vengeance and regret, we're not going to be running right. Just like our car engines don't run right when the powertrain control module fails. Paul is getting at the fact that our thinking has to change in order for our actions to follow. You see, if we're thinking about how to get even or how to get revenge, then that's what we're going to do. If we feel that nobody in this world loves us, it's very likely that even subconsciously we will start pushing people away from us. In order to reset and receive transformation, Paul says that we have to think about the stuff that's true, about the stuff that's honorable, just, pure, pleasing, and commendable. And I want to focus on these for a minute. The first thing he identifies is thinking about what is true. Now, truth is one of those uh, odd concepts because there are things in life that are kind of accepted as universal truths. I mean, there are 24 hours in a day. There are 364 and a quarter days in a year. The sky is blue, stuff like that. But for others, the truth that we hold in this life is based upon our lived experience. And that truth can differ from person to person. But either way, our brains can trick us into believing all sorts of falsehoods about ourselves and about others. So instead of thinking the worst about who we are or who someone else is or about the other people in our lives, we can exercise our ability to think and focus on the stuff that we know to be true. Second, Paul says, consider what is honorable. It's a tough one. In a sense, when we're angry, or when we're upset about something, the thoughts that sometimes cross our minds can include words or actions that would be incredibly harmful if they were carried out or spoken out loud. Instead, we're asked to cool it, to think about ways that we can respond that wouldn't escalate a situation, but however, might help to diffuse it. Third, think about what is just. Now, this isn't necessarily justice as in a sense of crime and punishment or an eye for an eye. Instead, it's looking at what is broken in our lives, what is broken in the lives of someone else, what is broken in our community, and how can we be an instrument to help put some of those broken pieces back together. Fourth, Paul says to think about what's pure. In his letter to the Galatians, he spells out all the stuff that's impure, and he gives quite a list, and he calls it all work of the flesh. He says, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. And in case he missed anything, he finishes with, and things like these. But by contrast, he lifts up the fruit of the Spirit, and he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You see, this latter list, that's the stuff that's pure. In the midst of trouble or difficult circumstances, our inclination sometimes is to seek out that fight, to get even, to choose sides, to become angry or jealous. We have to be cognizant enough sometimes to push that reset button before we go too far down that track towards a place where instead we're thinking about how do we make peace? How do I control myself, my own emotions, my own thoughts, my own reactions in this situation? How can I be generous? Which at times could simply be giving someone else the benefit of the doubt. Fifth, think about what is pleasing. Now, sometimes I think when we think, you know, what is pleasing, we think, well, if I stood up for myself or for someone else or for this conviction or that conviction, well, yeah, that would please me. If I purchased this or that, yeah, that would please me. It's not about pleasing ourselves. It's not about pleasing other people either. It's about pleasing God, which means that we're thinking about how we're going to approach something in such a way that we can act in a godly manner, but also that we're not going to be embarrassed or ashamed by our actions later on. Lastly, think about what is commendable. And this has to do for me with, with respect and integrity. How do you want to be seen in the midst of a conflict or in, in the midst of a negative circumstance? How do you want to be viewed in light of the not-so-good stuff that happens in life? Do you want people to see you as the person that always throws in the towel 
The person who throws the temper tantrum or the person who packs up the toys when they don't get their way and goes home or throws this big giant pity party. Or do you want to be seen as the one who was resilient, the one who was compassionate, the one who was courageous and strong, even in the face of adversity? The truth of the matter is that we're all going to face times in life when things aren't going the way we want them to or the way that we expected them to. We might be thrown into something that we didn't ask for, or we could be actively digging our own hole. But either way, we have two options, two approaches. One is to ignore the problem altogether, to continue to push through. The first week we watched the, the clip from Big Bang Theory where Penny kept ignoring the check engine light. That is the kind of thing that we can do. We can just push through and ultimately cause more damage, or we can seek out peace and seek to act for peace. And we find that peace when we push reset, when we flash our thought processes to focus on the positive instead of the negative. Peace of mind, something I think a lot of us want. I mean, we wanna be able to rest, to not worry, to, to feel free, to live and to enjoy our lives, our family, our friends, our work, our church, our hobbies, entertainment. We wanna be able to enjoy ourselves and this life that we've been given and not be burdened down with worries that rob us of vigor, of life and of purpose. And we can achieve peace when we change our thought processes, when we conscientiously decide that we're going to think about what's true, what's honorable, what's just, pure, pleasing, and commendable. But it's not enough to just think about these kinds of things. In the last verse of the passage we read today, Paul says that we should keep on doing the things that we have learned and received and heard and seen in him and that the God of peace will be with us. In other words, don't simply think about what is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, and commendable, but take it one step further. Act in ways that promote truth, honor, justice, purity, acceptability, and commendation. Our actions in life largely dictated by our thoughts. If we're thinking about someone in a hateful or spiteful way, we'll probably act the way, that way towards them, even if unintentionally. If we're thinking about somebody in a loving way, even our enemies, and that's hard, we'll act towards others in a kind way. The catch in all of this is that no matter how well we try to operate in this world, no matter how hard we try to follow God's will, we're still gonna make mistakes. Other people are going to make mistakes. We're going to hurt somebody. Somebody's going to hurt us. It's inevitable. Sin is an active part of this world. But the important thing is to remember to keep your systems in check. Stay in the lane that you know to be right. Check your blind spots. Make sure that what you are thinking about yourself or a situation is what others are thinking about yourself or the situation. Keep the temperature cool. Focus on the positive in order to accentuate it. And don't be afraid to apologize. As Paul finished his letter to the church at Philippi, he encouraged Christians to set their minds on everything that was true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, and commendable. And when we do those things, we set our minds on the kingdom of God. Our lives won't be without issue. Our roads are not always going to be paved with pure and flat and fresh asphalt. But if we do think about these things, we stand a greater chance of avoiding a faith crisis. Our blinders will either be loosened so our view is wider, or maybe they'll be taken down altogether. And we'll find ourselves at peace with what we're doing in this world. Just like the powertrain control module is the brains of our automobile's operation, our brains, our capacity to think can greatly enhance our ability to diagnose a problem earlier, which will help us to find a solution before that warning light leads to disaster. God gave us the ability to think. And for most of us, we can choose what we think about. And chances are, if we think about good stuff, the outcome will be good. And if our mind is filled with unkind thoughts, we're probably just going to make things worse. It's a process of trial and error, discernment and prayer, of listening and learning. I remember when I was a kid and I'd done something dumb or 
I, I had done something without thinking about it, my dad would often look at me and he'd go, what were you thinking? And I'd say, I wasn't. We have our call to think about the good, to act for the good. And my friends, we live in a world where the number of people who are actively standing and doing good, or at least the people who in, are doing good and, and are recognized for it, are shrinking into the minority. The week that I wrote this sermon happened to be the week following the tragedy in Orlando. And since that time, we've seen tragedies unfolding in our nation and in France as well. But I think in each of these instances, just as tragic to me were the folks that were on social media or the news outlets around the world turning these tragedies into an opportunity to promote political division, social division, and more hate. Because the last thing I feel that we should be doing when there's senseless loss of life is exploiting those who suffered in order to push forth our own agenda or our own gain. But if we're not thinking, it's easy to get sucked in. Our PCM has the power to help us rise above. It has the capacity to lead us even deeper into the pit. The choice is ours. When your mind is running rampant, Sometimes you have to have that internal conversation. What am I thinking about? What should I be thinking about? And how am I going to reset? You may have heard the phrase, you are what you eat, which makes absolutely no sense to me. But one that does is that you are what you think. The power to change your circumstance starts with your ability to change your thinking. When the PCM and Scarlet died, it meant that all of the systems on the car were set on default. They didn't adjust themselves to external or internal conditions. Everything just kind of stayed the course. Over time, this would have led to damage to the engine. Sometimes we get set on autopilot. We miss the warning lights in our own lives that let us know something is wrong or we start on a path of destruction and we don't realize what's going on because we're not thinking about it. Pay attention to the signs. We have those warning lights for a reason. Invite people into your life. Let them speak truth to you. Keep focused on the mission and think. Think about the story that you want your life to tell. Because the more you think about it, gives you a greater chance of making it a reality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for teaching us the right things to have on our minds and the ways in which we can enact them in everyday life. Help us to focus on what is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, and commendable so that we might live into your truth, treat others with honor, seek justice, purify ourselves of wickedness, be acceptable in your sight, and recognize the new creation that you are making within us. This we pray. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, may God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and be with you always. We'll see you in two weeks.